there was a time in the early 90s when I was doing a lot of long meditation retreats, and I think my mother felt it was necessary to explain to her friends what I was doing with my life. And she told her friends that Buddhism is not a religion, but rather a philosophy. Because in, in our household, religion wasn't, it was, uh, well, religion was frowned upon, but philosophy was okay. And so my mother asked me, is, it tr is, is that right? Is Buddhism a philosophy? And I thought about that and replied, well, B Buddhism certainly is a religion. There are people who take Buddhism very seriously as a religion. And it is a philosophy, and it is a psychology, and it can be a scholarly pursuit. But for me, the nugget, the thing that is really special about Buddhism is that it's a set of technologies for awakening. And I would say that everything else is, is designed to support that. After all, the, the word Buddha means awake. So we're talking about awakening, enlightenment. I would like to normalize enlightenment. There's an opportunity here as Buddhism moves into the West uh, to, to shake things up a little bit, to change some attitudes. And one of the attitudes that I think is very uh, pervasive is that enlightenment is for other people. It's for people who wear traditional clothing and, and or live in caves, primarily. But it isn't true. Enlightenment is, uh, it's an old word, maybe an outdated word, for human development. And human development is available to humans. I'd like to talk about this using a, a kind of a formula that I only half-jokingly think of as the, the three pillars of pragmatic dharma. It goes like this. Enlightenment is possible. That's number one. Number two, I know because it happened to me. And number three, here's how. So I'm going to cycle through that, through those three points over the next 20 minutes uh, in a kind of iterative fashion, going a little bit, deep, a little bit more deeply uh, with each iteration to make the case that enlightenment is for all of us. So this is going to require uh, explaining what do I mean when I say enlightenment. Uh, And also, by the way, when I say it happened to me, uh, it happened to whom? If, if the essential insight, <laughs> if the essential insight is that there isn't anybody here, why would I say such a preposterous thing? Well, there's a reason why I'm saying it this way, and I'll explain. And I'll talk a little bit about these, the technologies that I'm referring to. So what is, what is enlightenment? Let's start with awakening, momentary awakening. This is where it starts. We are in an auditorium in the, at the University of the West in Rosemead, California, which is part of the Los Angeles megalopolis. And Los Angeles is one of the greatest port cities in the world. There's a port here at San Pedro. If you listen very carefully, Maybe you can hear, maybe we can hear the ships in the harbor at San Pedro. But on the other hand, no, there's no chance. San Pedro is probably, I don't know, 40 miles from here. Los Angeles is big. We can't hear these ships. And yet the very effort or the very inclination of the mind to listen for something that is so subtle, and in this case, 
uh, undefined does something to the mind. Try it again. Listen for the ships in in San Pedro. Never mind that you don't know what it's going to sound like. There's a possibility for a kind of openness and a kind of quiet in the mind where the mind stops yammering at you for a moment. So let's call this a moment of awakeness. Enlightenment, I'm using in a a slightly different way. I'm talking about something developmental. So to understand the enlightenment as a development or a developmental process, let's establish two two poles. Let's say over here on your left is not enlightened, totally clueless, the uninstructed yogi, the uninstructed worldling. And over here on your right is no room for improvement. This is the Buddha. And you can imagine a line between these two points, a continuum from not very enlightened to a little bit of enlightenment and more and more. So we have a developmental, developmental process. And each, at each point along the way, as you move this way to your right, you're having more of these moments of awakeness in relation to your moments of unawakeness. But does it have to be binary? Is it either totally clueless or completely enlightened to the point where there's no room for improvement? No, certainly not. And in fact, not only is there an infinite continuum, uh, there is a tipping point. Somebody who's been doing this practice and has gotten to this tipping point Uh, This is what I'm calling enlightenment, the the official enlightenment point. Now notice, this person isn't yet a Buddha. And it seems like there's a lot to go here. And yet something very significant has happened. Uh, At the tipping point, it's as though you've been riding your bicycle uphill for some period of years, usually, decades. And sometimes the wind is in your face and sometimes it's at your back but you're generally riding uphill. At the tipping point, you've crested the hill and you're riding downhill. So here again, sometimes the wind is in your face and sometimes it's at your back, but you know you've got this. And it may be, people often say at this point, it may be that even if I didn't practice, this would continue to unfold. Um, It it so happens that people do continue to practice at that point because the momentum is so strong. So that's what I'm talking about as enlightenment, as a continuum and as as a tipping point. So I'll go to the second point. It happened to me. This is why I'm confident telling you about it, and why would I say that? Why would I say that in the face of the taboo against saying it? I don't think the taboo is helpful. It may have served at one time, but I think now, I think transparency is good. So if I think I'm enlightened, I should say so. Now, I may be wrong, and if I'm wrong, then the rest of you will point it out, and and hopefully something good will come of that, because I will uh, get more enlightened through through the interaction. I think the more we talk about this, the better we get at at teaching it and the better we get at learning it.
What about this question of to whom does it happen? I don't know to whom it happens. So I'll move on to the third point, here's how. <laughs> There's a Zen koan that I think is, is kind of cute. But when I think of Zen koans, I, I often think, when you, you hear the exchange between the, the student and the master, I hear uh, the voice of little Kwai Chang Kane from, from the Kung Fu television show talking to Master Po, the, the blind master. So uh, in this one, the student says, Master, what is the most important thing? And the master says, uh, the most important thing is attention. Ah, yes, master, but what is the second most important thing? The second most important thing is attention. <laughs> oh, yes, master, but what is the third most important thing? The third most important thing is attention. What is the common denominator between, uh, among all of these technologies for awakening? It is attention. And there are lots of ways to apply attention, lots of things to uh, apply attention to. Something Shinzen Young said in an offhand remark years ago got me thinking about a way to uh, categorize all of these different uh, practices from different traditions. Shinzen said when he, uh, when things are difficult, he will downshift to mindfulness of the body as kind of first gear. So I took that ball and ran with it. Uh, I think of this as, as being divided into three gears, a kind of three-speed transmission. First gear is looking at the objects of awareness, the changing phenomena of mind and body. So vipassana is first gear. Second gear is to turn the attention around and ask the question, to whom is this happening? So that would be Advaita Vedanta or certain kinds of Zen, Watto. And third gear is to recognize, as, as Tibetan Buddhists might say, the essential nature of mind to recognize what is always already done. This moment is perfect as it is, and you need only recognize that. So that's the three-speed transmission. And one way to approach it is to go to third gear first. If you can see that this moment is perfect as it is, well, I would just look at that. If that's difficult, if you're not able to get traction, then you can downshift to second or first gear. Let's go back to the beginning. What is enlightenment? There's a, there's a 2007 University of Toronto study that used fMRI scans to look at the brains of meditators. And they, they posited two modes of attention, which I, I don't think they made up. I think this goes back to William James at least. Two modes of attention, experiential focus and narrative focus. Experiential focus would be paying attention to something that's going on. You're, you're engaged in what's going on. Uh, Vipassana would be a good way to do that, or even just listening now to the sound of the air conditioner. 
will move your mind into experiential focus. And narrative focus is when we're telling ourselves a story about our experience. These are two very different very, two de- very different ways that the mind works. Does that mean three minutes are left? Your essential job in order to get enlightened is to change is to change the mode from the narrative which is the default focus to the experience. If you do this, if you do this consistently, you will change the wiring of your brain. This is what the the study in question found, that the brain structure and functioning change, and this is what these fMRI studies continue to find. You can perform neurosurgery on yourself by again and again shifting the mode from the narrative to the experience. This is not easy because the default is the narrative. This is how human beings are set up. Enlightenment is possible. It's a realistic goal for everyone in this room. It's a realistic goal for everyone. I know because it happened to me, at least to the tipping point. I haven't yet gotten to no room for improvement. (laughs) And here's how. Attention. And by the way, this room is filled with people who know how to do this, who know how to teach this. Thank you. <laughs>